Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you for joining us today. Thank you for joining us today. Welcome to the panel on the Indo Pacific. My name is Natalie Stanley. I'm currently a research fellow with the Perth US Asia Centre and a doctoral scholar at the Australian National University. Today we'll be talking about the Indo Pacific. Is it going somewhere or going nowhere? What are the points of convergence and divergence? In order to illuminate us about what is the current most preeminent geopolitical construct that spans everywhere from Alaska to Madagascar, that includes the world's most populous nations, includes the world's two most influential superpowers, includes a myriad of geopolitical architecture, including ASEAN, Indian Ocean Rim Association, and APEC, are five distinguished speakers. Um, briefly, I'll just call you in there from left to right. I have Professor Amitabh Acharya, a well-known international relations scholar and professor at American University. I have Ambassador Stephen Smith, who is a professor of law at the University of Western Australia and foreign, former foreign minister of Australia. In the middle, we have Dr. Siswa Pramono, who is currently the head of policy analysis and development at the Indonesian Ministry of Foreign Affairs. Um, we have Ambassador Masakuni Ishii, who is currently the ambassador of Japan to the Republic of Indonesia. And to my left, we have Mr. Dhruva Jai Shankar, who is currently a Foreign Policy Studies Fellow at, Brook at Brookings Institute in India. Would you please put your hands together to welcome our speakers. So for today's session, each speaker will start with a brief presentation for five to seven minutes before we engage in a panel discussion, and then I invite members of the audience to ask willing questions of our speakers as well. So to kick us off, may I please invite Dr. Siswa to start the discussion. Uh, thank you very much. Yeah. Thank you very much. Uh, I'm not sure whether my slide is uh, here, uh, but okay, in the next five minutes, I just would like to introduce uh, very quickly uh, there are a lot of concepts in the Pacific, at least five. American person, Australian person, uh, of and uh, Japanese one. Even Russia also had one. They call it the uh, uh, Asia, uh, uh, Asia Pacific, Indo Pacific, something like that. Now, uh, the question will be on ASEAN whether or not ASEAN should have its own. Now, Indonesia is trying to encourage our ASEAN friend, okay, come on, guys, we need to have one. Why we need to have one? Because we already discussed this for a long time. 2013, we already talked about the Pacific ASEAN version. Even you can find it in ASEAN document. Now, the question will be uh, where we should put uh, this hour in the Pacific uh, into what kind of platform? So, for ASEAN, the first platform will be uh, uh, the East ASEAN Summit. Why? Because we have Japan, Korea, China, United States, Russia, all on board in the East ASEAN Summit. The point is that if you look at the map of the Pacific, then ASEAN is right in the middle. So it can function as a fulcrum with two qualities. The first one will be the fulcrum for norm setting, nuclear weapon free zone, a zone of peace, freedom, and neutrality, and Treaty of Amity and Cooperation. Now we have 37 countries joining the Treaty of Amity and Cooperation. The last one, then we got uh, meeting with Singapore, uh, Argentina, and Iran. So this is the, 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 the norm setting things that we can discuss uh, in open light uh, on what uh, the Indo-Pacific should be in the region. Number two, we would like to have a concrete project on Indo-Pacific, so not only writing in the sky, but something that we can implement in the ground. So then we have the good example of the master plan of Russian connectivity, for instance. For 10 years, uh, thanks to Thailand, we are uh, in designing the master plan of Russian connectivity. Since we have the master plan, that's quite easy then, uh, to accommodate, let's say, PRI. We would have a master plan. And also, when uh, the Japanese come up with the ASEAN African Grid Corridor, we already have a master plan of Russian connectivity. So we can uh, uh, to find a connecting dot. Yeah. So the idea is that, uh, put in a simple way, uh, we have a platform, it's called East Asian Summit. We are not going to dilute uh, varieties of the Pacific that already in existence now. The American was welcome with their Indo Pacoms, Australia and the Pacific, Japanese points. The point is that how, how can, can we put everything together uh, in, in the table of East Asian Summit and we try to find commonalities. Uh, we do exercise this in uh, India, for instance. When we have the same vision of Indonesia and India on uh, cooperation on uh, in the Pacific, and now we come up with projects uh, like the uh, Andaman Nico 
for an object connectivity, for instance. So uh, to put things uh, together as a, as, a, as a summary, for ASEAN, indo pacific must first, it is not containment, it is not based on uh, <coughs> perception of threat, but since the nature of ASEAN is welcoming, uh, we have a welcoming culture that it should be uh, a point of cooperation. Yes, we have variety of the Pacific. We try to find commonalities, not to blend into one, uh, but we can find commonalities. And this is not a theory. A reality is that now we have a scheme, Japanese and China, uh, for the third market. We are going to have project in Thailand working together. Japanese, uh, sorry, China and French. They are working together, I think, soon in the, in the Africa, in Francophone Africa. Yeah. There, there are always possibility to have uh, 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 commonalities because politicians, they talk that they think on balance of power, but all uh, economies, uh, all companies, they are talking with the, the same logic that your marginal cost, cross marginal revenue, your profit will be maximized. It doesn't really matter where you're from. So I think uh, we, we have a lot of chance. First, more open discussion on that, find commonality and work together. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Cicero. Next man, please invite Professor Smith to give his remarks. Thanks, David. In the 1980s to 1990s, Australia viewed the world as the Asia Pacific because we saw the strength of the North American economy, of the European economy, but we also detected that in terms of the rise of economic and strategic power, that Asia was also on the rise, in particular China. And so in the course of those two decades, most of the Australian general denomination of uh, the world was uh, centred upon the Asia Pacific and our work in encouraging APEC to go from a trade minister institution to a prime minister and president institution is probably the best example of that analysis. But in the early 2000s, we came to the conclusion in Australia that uh, there were more things happening than the ongoing economic importance of the United States and the rise of China. Other things were occurring. Uh, Indonesia was also on the rise, as was, as was uh, India. And so uh, in about uh, 2008, 2009, we started describing the world informally as the Indo-Pacific. And this reflected the fact that Australia as an island country and an island continent is touched by more than one ocean, the Pacific Ocean, it's touched by the Indian Ocean. I come from Perth, which we describe as our Indian Ocean capital. And so we started to see the world as not just the ongoing importance of the United States, both strategically, militarily, and economically, but the rise of China as a great power, the rise of Indonesia and uh, ASEAN as a significant uh, influence, and the rise of India. In 2013, for the first time in an Australian government official document, we described the world as the Indo-Pacific, or our, our region as the Indo-Pacific, in the 2013 Defence White Paper. And successive Australian government formulations have continued in that vein, culminating with our 2017 Foreign Policy White Paper, where uh, the phrase Indo-Pacific uh, is found on multiple occasions. Uh, and why did we come to that conclusion? We came to the conclusion as to the mainstream of economic and strategic uh, analysts and thinkers into the future, that by the time we get to 2035, Indonesia will have the same global share of GDP as uh, Japan does, and by the time we get to 2035, India will have the same share of global GDP that the United States does. By the time we get to 2050, uh, the three largest economies in the world will be China, India, and the United States, probably in that order. And the fourth largest economy will be Indonesia. Uh, and if not Indonesia by itself, then certainly, I believe, will occur, then certainly Indonesia and the ASEAN economic community. So that economic, strategic, political uh, power is on the rise. That drags strategic power from the Pacific and North Asia, uh, South and West. You can't have an Indo-Pacific without India, and you can't have an Indo-Pacific without Indonesia. 
And that works very well from both an Indonesian and ASEAN analysis as it does from Australia. Australia's analysis, because it puts Australia, uh, just as Indonesia is, at the fulcrum of that, albeit slightly south by uh, to 200 to 400 kilometres, if you measure our closest, uh, closest points. So if you start to view our part of the world in that context, it tells you that from Australia's perspective, for example, we need to do much more to enhance our trade, investment, and strategic and defence relationship with Indonesia, which we are doing, and to do likewise with, uh, with India. It's also important to, I think, say, well, it's impossible to have a piece of the regional architecture which would go from Hollywood to Bollywood or Miami to uh, Madagascar as described, I think, by Natalie. But it doesn't mean that you can't have some focus on the notion of the Indo-Pacific. And this is why I think uh, Australia encouraging the United States uh, and Indonesia working with Singapore and other countries in, in ASEAN to get the United States to join the East Asia Summit is significant in this context because with the East Asia Summit, you've now got ASEAN centrality as part of an ASEAN-related uh, 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 institution, but you've also got key powers in the broader Indo-Pacific who aren't members of ASEAN in their meeting in the East Asia Summit, whether it's presidents and prime ministers, whether it's foreign ministers, or whether it's defence ministers meeting in the uh, defence ministers uh, plus two configuration. So uh, this is, if you ask the question, is the Indo-Pacific going somewhere or going nowhere, it's certainly going somewhere. It is possible that economies and nations and strategic influence can falter or fail. But I don't think that the Indian uh, rise will be, will be uh, thwarted. Uh, they're on a slower trajectory than the rise of China, but by the time we get to somewhere between 2040 and 2050, we'll have three great powers, China, US, and India. And I don't think that Indonesia will fail either, either economically or strategically. And we spoke this morning about uh, power and influence brings it with responsibility. Indonesia will have to accept the responsibility of not just being a regional influence, but being a global influence. And in my view, that will be a, a good thing. It works for a small country like Australia, where 25 million population, uh, we are a large economy in the G20, as is India and Indonesia. But from Australia's perspective, the economic predictions by 2050, um, Indonesia will be the fourth largest economy in the world, India the first or the second, and Australia will be doing well to be in the top 30 economies. So it's very important from Australia's perspective to continue to grow these trade and investment relationships in the Indo-Pacific. So that whilst our relative economic uh, percentage of GDP might fall because of the rise of other economies, our share of prosperity as a small country will continue. It's in everyone's interest, as we saw this morning, to, to want to be optimistic, to want to be positive, and to chase prosperity for individual countries, our region, and uh, the various people who make, make uh, that up. So I think the Indo-Pacific is a notion that is now unstoppable. When Australia first started talking about it, there was some scepticism, but now you find across the board pretty much uh, all of the countries in our part of the world see the world through those lenses. So for example, when Prime Minister Modi came to Indonesia, came to Jakarta, uh, he spoke uh, with President Jokowi about the Indo-Pacific. Uh, the notion of the Indo-Pacific was central to uh, Prime Minister Modi's contribution to the Shangri-La Dialogue in Singapore a short period of time after he was in Jakarta. So, uh, this is not just an idea whose time has come, this is an idea which is unstoppable and we all need to respond accordingly. Thank you. Thank you, Stephen. Ishizan, and the majority of the making remarks, please. Thank you, Nandi, for this opportunity. I, I do have a slide. Can you show that, please? Only four slides, so don't worry. Um, we do have a concept called the uh, free and open Indo-Pacific. From now I will refer to it as FOIA. And that's our strategy. Uh, we are not as organized as uh, Indonesia or Australia. It's more like a kira-kira type to be, to be developed. But 
Let me start from why do we need it, right? It says to realize stable and prosperous Indo Pacific region by combining vitality of Asia and Africa. I mean, if you look around the globe, we only can identify two centers for vitality from now on Africa, Asia, period. So, our uh, aim is to, in order to realize a decent prosperity of the world as a whole. We need to make the best of these two vitality centers, which means we need to have a better connection between these two centers of vitality. That's where we need the concept of Indo-Pacific. So how to do it? By developing a free and open Indo-Pacific region as international public goods through ensuring the rule-based international order in a comprehensive, inclusive, and transparent manner, blah, blah, blah. But the most important thing is, what do you see in the center, in the hinge of two oceans? ASEAN. You are in the center of this Indo-Pacific uh, relation. And the success of this strategy depends on it. Depends how, what kind of role ASEAN can play. And what should we do to achieve this? Uh, I have listed three. Promotion, promoting the rule of law, pursuing economic prosperity through improving connectivity, and also supporting capacity building for promoting peace and stability. Period. As simple as these two. So this strategy needs to be a little bit more developed. Now the second strategy. Then I, I want to tell you in more details what this means and what this doesn't mean. First, this FOIP is not to create a new institution for architecture. This is just a strategic concept. Second, FOIP is not to override or undermine existing organizations such as ASEAN. It's quite contrary. As I said, ASEAN should play the major role, central role for making this strategy success. And actually, FOIP and TAP share the same basic principles. Number three, FOIP is not an exclusive club or to contain counter anyone. I think uh, uh, former speakers talked about it more and I mean, cooperation under FOIP is open to any club. That supports this idea and is ready to work with us, including China. And uh, as Francisco was mentioning, nowadays we are trying to find uh, the project where Japan and China can cooperate for the development of connectivity issues. And one issue, quote, Japan, uh, US, Australia, and India, there have been a discussion that this is, uh, this is recorded behind all these, uh, all these secret organizations promoting something smoking, that sort of thing. No, court has nothing to do with this. Court is not the platform of this. As I said, this is open to anybody who is ready to sign it. Number four, is this a sort of a empty, empty idea of it? No. I think uh, this will bring about tangible benefits. We will actively implement ODA project under FYP. This is a bureaucratic way of saying that we put priority to those projects who are labeled under this. If it contributes to the connectivity in this region, we put priority in giving out our work here. So it has some tangible impact on that. Number five is, this is not technically really a concept. We are open to any kind of suggestion. Actually, my, my view is that there is not one and only Indo-Pacific policy. There can be many different things. And then sometimes we convert, sometimes we don't. Our task is to give you as many options as possible so that you can pick and choose good one for you. But we do need to have some basic critical share. That's my impression. Last but not least, what does this mean to Indonesia? I think most of the participants are from Indonesia. Next slide, yeah. <laughs> this is right. Uh, I don't have much time left, I think. So, you know, uh, for the promotion of rule of law, we have done a lot of the seminars and so on and so forth. I can skip that. Second, pursuit of economic prosperity. I'll explain a little bit about the, the, about the outer islands development project we are now working on. We, I, I'll give you the slide later. But we have been doing a lot of infrastructure projects inside in Indonesia, which contribute to the concept of free and open Indo Pacific. And for future, I think in order to make the best of the vitality of these two continents, uh, Japan and Indonesia can cooperate with each other for the development of places like Africa. I think we are working on that already. And uh, maybe the last slide, please. This is uh, one uh, specific example which I should call a project under FOIP. Uh, this is the development of outer islands 
and promotion fisheries of those islands. Starting from Salam, the west, which is very close to India, then Natuna, very good place for fishing, as well as uh, maybe base in the Navy, and uh, Talao, Morotai, which is just in the south of Philippines. From there, going to Japan is the same as going to Japan. Then we have the yeah, we have uh, Panamulai, we have Saudaki, we have more. Our plan, we've been asked by the Indonesian government to develop industries over there, including fishing as well as tourism, so that the, the, the you know, gap between the rich and poor, gap among the region can be narrowed down, which is good for your development, which is good for the collective. Thank you very much. I've been too long. Thank you. Um, I am probably the least knowledgeable of uh, the entire panel on this uh, Indo-Pacific <coughs> concept. So I will fall into my academic hat and talk about uh, concepts and history. I do spend a lot of time studying regions and regionalisms and how regions are made. <coughs> so my proposition one is that uh, there are no natural regions. Regions are artificial construct. construct where some uh, international lessons theories call socially constructed. And uh, give you a good example, uh, Southeast Asia. There was no reason for Southeast Asia before World War II, uh, certainly not before the 1920s. It was the British, uh, the Allied Southeast Asia Command that created the notion of Southeast Asia. And uh, there's an anecdote which I recently heard from a very uh, severe retired diplomats who actually drafted the ASEAN Declaration. He said, when, uh, you know, the Economic and Social Commission for the Asia Pacific, ESCA, when it was being created, uh, the British wanted to name it as the Economic and Social Commission for the Far East. And the Thai said, far of what? Far from what? East of what? Uh, for Southeast Asians, we're not far from this region. And we're, you know, neither east nor west. We are in the region and they changed the name to ESCAP as opposed to Social Commission of Far East. But uh, the term Near East, Middle East, Far East are all British Foreign Service concepts and names. The United States created also <coughs> the Pacific Command, the Pacific Theater. Uh, the United States created a region called Southwest Asia after the Soviet invasion of Afghanistan. Nobody gets about it anymore. So regions have perished about Don Emerson would say, nations come and go, why not regions? So keep that in mind. Secondly, regions change. Uh, you know, we have seen how many changes have happened in our lifetime. Asian regionalism, the Asia Pacific with uh, a hyphen, Asia Pacific without a hyphen, and then we come from APEC with East Asia now regionalism after the 97 economic crisis. So we have East Asian Summit, and uh, now we're moving to uh, Indo-Pacific. Uh, so regions are not permanent entities in any sense. So with that in mind, the regions are uh, socially constructed, are politically constructed, and they are uh, uh, transient, you no know, permanence. Look at Indo-Pacific. Uh, my first uh, observation here is that uh, there are competing notions of Indo-Pacific. They may be complementary, but there are also tension between, say, what Martin Nagalagawa had talked about, uh, Indo-Pacific, uh, which is based on a treaty, uh, an ex extension of ASEAN Supreme of Indian Corporation, and that would be the anchor of Indo-Pacific, as opposed to the American concept, which is very strategic, not rather than normative. So overnight, we changed uh, the U.S. Pacific Command to U.S. Indo-Pacific Command. Uh, and it's, uh, the message, the signal in China is very clear that this is a strategic concept. I'm not even talking about the Quad, which uh, sometimes gets conflated, at least in the Chinese mind, that what is the Quad and what is the Pacific. Uh, so so <clears throat> that tension has to be resolved. I had the opportunity to have a cup of tea with uh, Madam Ibu Ritno this morning, and I asked her this question, and uh, she, of course, said, uh, Indonesia will promote the ASEAN centric concept of Indo Pacific, not the American centric concept. Because that's strategic. I hope I'm not misquoting her. You can, you can, uh, you can uh, ask her yourself. Uh, and uh, the other thing that uh, 
concerns me about this concept is institutional architecture. Now, institutions are not everything, but it's good to have them to create certain endurance and permanence. Look at APEC, uh, Asia Pacific Economic Cooperation. It took 20, 30 years of first track to economics meeting economists, uh, Pacific APEC. Then we had an institution called APEC in Australia. So Australians, Americans, Japanese, and the ASEAN came in a little later, created a track to a Christian community, then an institution make that concept viable. And even that didn't last after the, and after the economic crisis, it kind of faded away. And now it's a very weak, APEC is very weak. So what is the institutional architecture of the Indo-Pacific is something that will determine whether it is going to live or die. Uh, at the moment we have APEC, but India is not a member, so I would like rather recommend to rename APEC, bring India in, and call it Indo-Pacific Economic Forum. I just saw Jurassic Park, Jurassic World, and they have something called Indoraptor. So Indoraptor is a very good metaphor for uh, uh, Indo-Pacific economic cooperation. Here's an idea, a great idea. Uh, so I think we need that because uh, all the economic institutions are set by the United States and North Korea. <coughs> PPP, China, and India are not part of it. So unless we create some sort of an overarching institution, there are some military cooperation in the Indian Marine Association, but very quickly, the Asia Pacific part of institutionalism is much more robust than the Indian Ocean part of the Indian Pacific. And there is really nothing bringing tying those two together. And that will be a major challenge for the people who are advocating this concept and whether it will go somewhere or go nowhere to make that difference between those two outcomes. Thank you very much, Professor. Last but not least, Drew Uh Thank you very much, Nadia. Thank you to the organizers and thanks to all of you for, for being here uh, for the session. I'm just going to make two uh, quick points. One is a general observation on the Indo Pacific, and, and secondly, just give a slightly Indian perspective on how we see uh, developments in the region. So the first observation is that what, what are we actually talking about when we say, use the term in the Pacific? And I think there's some common strands, while we have differences, as, as Professor Acharya pointed out. There are really two common strands, whether the term is used in Washington, or Jakarta, or Canberra, or Tokyo, or Singapore, or New Delhi. One is that it refers to the Indian and Pacific Oceans as a single strategic space. We can, there's maybe some disagreement as to how, how much of the Indian and how much of the Pacific Oceans. But that's broadly the idea, that there's a, a single strategic continuum. The second uh, is by defining the region by the oceans, uh, rather than the land masses, we're effectively emphasizing the maritime component of this region. Not to the exclusion of what happens on the Indian hinterlands, uh, but, uh, but certainly emphasizing that this is where the future of strategic competition, the future of trade, the future of economic development will be taking place. And I think that these are the two common strands in terms of the use of the Indo Pacific across, uh, across the region. Uh, we have a lot of differences uh, which I'll get into. Now, to get into the, how, where India sees it, uh, in some ways the story for India starts and ends in Indonesia. Um, when India became independent in 1947, uh, even actually before independence, uh, the government, the, the, the first Prime Minister, Jawaharlal uh, Nehru, hosted a conference in Delhi uh, called the Asian uh, Relations Conference. And we had delegates from uh, China, from Australia, from Indonesia. In fact, uh, the Prime Minister, Sultan Shabir Kane, who's flown to India at a great uh, risk to his personal safety, uh, for which uh, by, by a pilot named uh, Biju uh, Patnaik, who uh, was given Indonesia's highest honor. Um, and so, from the beginning, I think there was this idea of a wider Asia. Um, in 1955, I think the epitome of it was the Bandung Conference held here which again was meant to be inclusive. Uh, uh, the People's Republic of China was invited, Zhao and I came for that conference here to Indonesia, despite the objections that many countries at the time had to including China in the regional architecture. But in the 1960s and 70s and 80s, a very na a much narrower sense of Asia became uh, more complex. Uh, and this was at a time that the US was withdrawing after Vietnam from the region, uh, that China was still looking inwards, uh, mainland China, that Japan was exerting itself economically, but not militarily. Uh, India, too, was very resource starved in this period. And Australia had many differences with Southeast Asia, not, not least Indonesia. 
And so this was a period actually when ASEAN took hold uh, and grew, uh, and again, with some substantial Indonesian leadership. But it was also a time when Asia began to be defined in much more narrow terms. So the Indo-Pacific in some ways reflects the new realities of today. The realities in which China has a military base in Djibouti. The reality of the United States being invited to the East Asia Summit, the Apex Regional Leadership Summit. Uh, 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 Japan that is now remilitarizing in many ways um, and becoming a more normal country. And India that is more active, and Indonesia that is more active, uh, South Korea that is more active across the region. And so the Indo-Pacific is basically a way of, of broadening the region. Uh, and uh, for India, the started getting, uh, taking, um, uh, the term started to be used in strategic circles around 2007, 2008. We started seeing it used by the strategic community. And in 2013, the former Prime Minister, uh, Manmohan Singh, actually used it in an official context in a speech he gave in Japan for the first time. Uh, earlier this year, in 2018, after his visit uh, to Jakarta, Prime Minister Modi in Singapore perhaps articulated in most detail what India believes uh, the Indo-Pacific to be. And he said that it was not a strategy, it was a concept, and in many ways it was the scope for India's Act East policy. It defined the geographical terms. But he also added a normative element. He mentioned that this should be a free, open, and inclusive region. Uh, freedom meant freedom from coercion, uh, in his words, not based on the power of the few, but on the consent of all. Openness referred to a number of things, including freedom of navigation, transparency, uh, the rule of law, and inclusivity, I think, was the, the actually the most valuable addition that he gave to the concept. Uh, and in, in, he basically argued that Southeast Asia was at the center of it, that the Indo-Pacific concept was not inconsistent with ASEAN unity or ASEAN centrality. Uh, and Indonesia, uh, in many ways, being at the center of ASEAN, plays an important role. My final point is, what does this actually mean in practice? I've, I've outlined very briefly the conceptual evolution. But what does that really mean in tangible terms? And I think for India, this will really be stepping up to help secure the Indian Ocean region. Uh, and not, nothing will be less important, in fact, than cooperation with Indonesia in this domain. Uh, this will mean coordinated patrols, which are already uh, under the discussion. Cooperation at forums like IORA, uh, the Indian Ocean Rim Association that, that uh, Indonesia was a chair of. Uh, and uh, development of, the, including uh, the development of uh, port and other infrastructure in the region. Secondly, for India, it would mean greater integration with ASEAN. Uh, this has already happened diplomatically. India now has an ambassador to ASEAN here in Jakarta. We have a division in our foreign ministry that is now dedicated to ASEAN affairs. Um, but uh, India also hosted earlier this year the leaders of all 10 uh, ASEAN countries in India for its Republic Day, its National Day celebrations in January of this year. And so diplomatically, you'll already start to see India engaging. But it also means greater security cooperation and furthermore, greater economic development. And that includes connectivity by road, rail, and over the sea. Finally, uh, it will also mean deepening uh, security cooperation with many other actors in the region, not just Southeast Asia. Uh, but others as well. And that includes uh, the United States, it includes Japan, it includes Australia, uh, but is not exclusive to any of these countries. Um, so I would uh, largely concur with the other speakers uh, in, in, in underscoring that fact. Um, so with that, let me end my remarks and look forward to the discussion. Remarkably, very peaceful and consensus driven discussion. It seems quite at odds with what the dangerous world that Patina outlined this morning and the risk of drift, the fault lines, the potential competition and conflict we may see in the future. So I just want to press our speakers a little bit more. Um, I'd like to start with Pat Siswo and uh, Professor Smith. Jenna, you've both worked in the context of, and it's for you, as we're currently in the context of government, um, in context where you've got limited resources. So far, each of you have outlined a concept of the Indian Pacific, which doesn't seem to transcend necessarily what we have at present, which are based on transnational interactions, uh, existing instruments like the East Asia Summit, um, and existing modes of financial cooperation. What I'm seeking to hear from all of you, it would be more of the same, but labeled Indo-Pacific. 
are we best placed to get the most out of this new Indo-Pacific construct by investing in these pre-existing structures, or are we best designating our diplomatic and defense diplomacy, our resources into things like deep reform in the United Nations, whereby one would have Japan, possibly <laughs> India, possibly Indonesia, having more representation in these kinds of structures, or are we better off directing those resources towards this you know, souped up Indo-Pacific, so I'll start with you, Pastor, so what do you think? Yes, uh, I think even if you are talking about the United Nations, uh, the scheme in the United Nations is that uh, every region is mostly also responsible for the security and stability of the region. That, uh, and, and for ASEAN, uh, uh, the way we, we, we handle our philosophy is not about defense, but about national resilience. So if every country in ASEAN has a better improvement in the national resilience, then it will be a very good contribution to the stability of the region as well. So, uh, past people already mentioned uh, 2030, 2050, that Indonesia is, uh, or ASEAN is getting bigger, but actually it's happening now. Now, if we are talking about purchasing or heritage of Indonesia, we already 2.5 trillion, that almost three times Australia. Yeah? But yeah, you, you see China with 21 trillion US dollar purchasing or heritage. Uh, compared to Australia and New Zealand, but at the same time, we have seen Indonesia and China and fragile state index with a very small index uh, because the, the per capita income is small. If you compare with Australia, okay, 1.1 trillion US dollar, but we are talking about 40,000 income per capita. They are more stable. So I think uh, it's not only uh, size matters, quality matters, no. Again, against uh, uh, what your question is, we believe that uh, ASEAN centrality, uh, we have experience uh, to live with China, not only 200 years, but 1,000 years. Yeah. So uh, with India, not only 100 years, but 2,000 years. Uh, culturally, Indonesia is pretty close with India, but from a long time ago, we have a contact trade with China. So uh, experience matters. Uh, I believe that with ASEAN centrality, there are a lot uh, that we can uh, contribute to the region. I think the most important thing about the Indo-Pacific is accepting that that reflects the strategic reality that we're now going through. And as each day, year, decade goes by, it's something that's something even more consolidated. So that's the first one. You accept the strategic reality, that's the analysis of what then do you do about it. Uh, and I think it's, it's slightly sort of harsh to say that it's been business as usual with nothing occurring. Indonesia, Singapore, ASEAN didn't welcome the United States into the East Asia summit because it didn't see these things occur. In an ideal world, uh, India, Japan and Indonesia would be permanent members of the United Nations Security Council, but I'm not going to hold my breath for reform of the Security Council that requires the P5 to vote itself out of existence. Um, in terms of pieces of the regional architecture which can add to that strategic analysis, ASEAN is clearly the most well-defined part of the regional structure, and East Asia Summit is central to that, as in ASEAN Central. The Pacific Island Forum works very well, but India, Indonesia, Australia have put considerable effort into Biora over the last six to eight years, reflecting the need for the Indian Ocean architecture to, be go, to, to go to a higher level. The first thing we did was to change its name, so we now understand what it means, Indian Ocean River Association and then India, Australia, Indonesia chaired it for six years in a row. So that was a reflection of we need to improve that piece of the, uh, of the architecture. Um, in terms of other bits of the architecture, I strongly support India going into APEC as does Australia. That again reflects uh, the economic uh, change that has occurred uh, since APEC uh, was instituted as a, as a, trade, uh, as a, as a trade forum. So, we're slowly seeing these things which are occurring, which reflect the reality. And once you accept that that's where the strategic reality is, you do things as a necessary consequence. And no surprises to guessing why Australia and Indonesia thought it was a good idea to resuscitate the IA SIPA uh, trade talks and to bring that to a conclusion. No prizes to guessing why uh, countries are saying, how can we crisscross uh, the architecture and add to it. So we see now 
slowly but surely trilaterals emerging. So India, Japan, Australia at uh, foreign secretaries level. Suggestions for India, Indonesia, Australia uh, at, uh, at uh, officials level. These things were all developed as a result of an unambiguous agreement that this is where the world is going in terms of strategic, economic, military, uh, political, geopolitical power, and nation states respond accordingly. Professor Acharya, you've given us much more of an academic perspective talking about the strengths and weaknesses of different institutions over time, particularly in this region. From your academic perspective, what is your prescription for building up some of the institutionalization in the Indian Pacific to redress some of the weaknesses you talked about on the Euro side of the equation? Well, the first thing one should do is not to build a new institution. Um, so I would not recommend creating a new Indo Pacific uh, Secretary, uh, it's not an organization. But I think a couple of things that will help is, uh, uh, you know, think about bringing India into uh, APEC, even though APEC is relatively weak, but there is a, there is a movement towards that. Um, the, the, the issue here is not just institutions, it's also the nature of interdependence. And, um, you know, the reason why uh, Asia Pacific or East Asia both have certain credibility is because they're underpinned by a structure of interdependence, uh, production networks, and uh, trade, investment. And India was always worldwide. Uh, it was not part of the East Asian production network, and its degree of economic openness was much lower uh, than uh, the degree of economic openness in East Asia generally. But as India reforms itself, and uh, although it's not completely uh, there yet, and we still have issues about uh, Indian uh, position and negotiation within the RCEP, uh, and uh, but if this can become an incentive for India. Uh, because a lot of people pay attention to strategic dimension, and India is reluctant to turn the quad into anything more than a diplomatic uh, consultative mechanism rather than an alliance, and that's understandable. But what India could actually use the Indo Pacific concept creatively is to open up more and develop more of these uh, production uh, linkages with uh, East Asia, including. Uh, Japan, ASEAN. India is really getting close to ASEAN, but uh, again, we, the, the heart of uh, the core of this linkages would be, uh, you know, participating in supply chain production networks. That's why uh, Asia Pacific and East Asia were actually critical uh, regions. Uh, I'm going to have to move on for a yeah. second. Thank you. Um, the last question for, before we open up to the audience is for Dhruva and uh, Masasan. All speakers today have talked about the centrality of ASEAN and the need for a normative element um, within the Indo-Pacific, but there is no doubting the power and potency of hard power, particularly uh, naval capabilities. In that sense, looking beyond ASEAN, there are only a handful of countries that are able to govern or lay down some of the rules of the international system. Um, therefore, if you think about the Indo-Pacific, uh, who should govern and who should lead the Indo-Pacific? Um, in hard power terms, if possible, and if not, how do we how do we moderate that? How do we form some sort of consensus about how that should be governed? I will start with the ambassador first. I, I think the direct answer to your question is nobody is leading. We lead collectively. I think that that is the best way and easiest way to go ahead. But sort of stepping one way aside, away from that, I think. Uh, we do already have enough institutions here in this region. I think East Asia Summit has more or less all the major players. And the role ASEAN is playing in that is to make East Asia Summit more coherent and more productive and more focused. And I think in that sense, ASEAN is the driver. But I'm not saying ASEAN is not, does not have to be the only driver. There are some other countries who are there. And uh, I, I think the, the, this is separate from this uh, FOIC uh, issue, free and the whole in the Pacific. As somebody was arguing, I think the more sort of flexible network 
uh, we have. The more resilient we become, more connected we become, more predictable we become. Rather than having bilateral alliance, which we used to have, like what well, we still do have, Japan, United States, Australia, United States, and so on. I think nowadays we do have a sort of a wave of networks, trilateral, which makes the cooperation more fruitful and more connected. And then sometimes we merge and then create a quad. This is a way to develop the, 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 the I think, uh, regional cooperation. And maybe the very, very last point is uh, the best thing I've seen after this uh, strategy has been introduced is a closer relation between India and ASEAN, particularly Indonesia. I think this is one of the very key for the success and development of this region. India and Indonesia, both very big countries, try to be independent. They think they can do everything by themselves. But now it's different. They are cooperating with each other, which will create new vitality for the region to develop. You know, I think we have to think of regional architecture in two ways. Uh, in other words, institutions serve one of, broadly, one of two purposes. There are those that are meant to be inclusive uh, and as, uh, are, are really deliberative bodies. I mean, the UN, at the, at the global level, the UN uh, General Assembly is the passing case, but regionally that would be the East Asia Summit, uh, IORA in the Indian Ocean, APEC uh, on, on economic issues. Uh, and you have countries there that look ASEAN largely, countries that look very much uh, not like each other, uh, but it's a venue for them to, to, to deliberate uh, the issues. Separately, we will see very organically issue-specific uh, organizations develop, where there is a like-mindedness, where there is a common agenda, where there is more. Uh, and, and I think the proliferation of these smaller groupings that we are seeing is reflective of that. Uh, to take a, to, to uh, contrast this with Europe, Europe has the European Union and NATO, for example, but it also has the OSCE, which includes countries like Russia uh, and others. So I think we will see both of these develop over time. And some of the ones that we will develop will focus on counterterrorism, on uh, in, the, in the hard security space, on maritime security. Um, we're already seeing in some ways the Quad develop into a discussion, uh, a, a forum that focused uh, largely on maritime security. On strategic infrastructure will be another uh, area. So I think we will see a proliferation of these smaller ad hoc uh, institutions uh, coming up, uh, uh, but there will also always be a room for more inclusive organization. Thank you. All right, now I'm going to question to the audience. Ladies and gentlemen, I ask if you have a question, please raise your hand. Um, two questions, so please state your name and uh, one question per person and a question of a statement, please. So, yeah, maybe I have two questions. Anyone? Gentleman here and down the front, so. I'll just wait for the microphone. Uh, well, I'm, uh, I'm just graduating from last day university, so my question directed to um, Mrs. Uh, uh Yeah, uh, uh, recently just uh, promote the ideas from uh, Japan, uh, you know, Japan started in the of Indo Pacific, and then Japan has own uh, design for the free and open Indo Pacific. And my question is, uh, you know, uh, when we look back before Japan tried to uh, promote the prosperity in the middle of ASEAN and Asia, um, in ASEAN as well, 1997, uh, you know, the ASEAN uh, or Asia facing the financial crisis. And every time Japan also tries to help us, but uh, indeed Japan cannot even already bring, uh, you know, like bring up uh, kind of the Asian monetary fund. But uh, because of US uh, interference, and then Japan kind of give up and then created a lot of uh, another contribution might be kind of can uh, make. So, yeah. So the question is uh, when Japan has their open initiation and the free and open Indo Pacific. U.S. still giving interference, or Tibet can live uh, by their own, um, uh, you know, design of kind of the initiative. Thank you. We'll take another question then, please. Um, hello, uh, my name is Ifa Fendi. Uh, actually, my question is pretty Sam uh, with the previous, but uh, kind of specifically for uh, Mr. Uh, Masako Minishi, but uh, yeah, I'll, I also want a response from other uh, speakers. Um, 
You have mentioned before uh, regarding the Indo-Pacific, uh, also ASEAN as the center of Indo-Pacific. And then uh, what I'm going to ask you about is the first is does digital infrastructure, such as as infra digital infrastructure, since we know that uh, currently that not only physical infrastructure that are going to uh, connect us, but also digital infrastructure, such as uh, establishment blockchain in ports, uh, can enhance the connectivity in FOIP. Uh, and then the second one is, does Japan want to improve its significance in ICT, or maybe it's already have a role in the ICT uh, in FO in enhancing FOIP uh, connectivity? Thank you. Uh, one question goes to ten thousand rupees. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, can Japan lead or do we need the United States? I, I think more or less was, uh, we are independent country, we are happy to be. And uh, we, we do compare note with uh, Americans about uh, free and the domestic thing. Sometimes they come up with the same wording, but the concept can be quite different in some areas. So far, I do see some emphasis on the part of the United States on the security side. While our emphasis has been more on the prosperity side. I'm not saying the security side is not important. But I think so far, I think we've been rather complementary. And then when it comes to the uh, economic uh, uh, area, uh, there's always competition, not only with China, but also with the United States. So we are trying to make the best of our, our point. So sometimes we converge, sometimes we compete. I think that, that's the reality. And the uh, role of the digital economy, ICT, for your develop, future development, I do believe these are the, 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 the project which can be later clearly under the FOIP. And then we, we, we've been so far working on more on the physical side. But for future, I think you're a big country. You need the uh, help of ICT, you need the help of uh, you know, broadband and everything. So I think our emphasis will be shifting more and more towards that, this, this side. And then when we come up with a very good specific project, we're happy to deliver it under the FOIP. So there's a the audio, audio possibility and opportunity. Quick last words of us. Would you like to react to the question on the use of digital infrastructure in the Indo Pacific? Uh, yeah, it's just like an ASEAN experience. We are talking about uh, connectivity, we are talking on the seamless connectivity. That's been, uh, it's not only about infrastructure, but about how to synergize the law of the region or regulation. And digital is also part of that, and, and, and also people to people. And, and then of course infrastructure. So the role of digital uh, connectivity, I think, is, is very important and it is a very tricky one. Uh, it's much better if you compare the innovation index of the region is quite different. Like uh, Australia, uh, so Australia is pretty high, but Singapore is among the best, like uh, rank number three. And then we have uh, Malaysia, and Indonesia is trying to keep up. And so uh, I think uh, this is a, 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 a observation for cooperation. Uh, on that field. Thank you. Thank you very much. So ladies and gentlemen, it appears that the Indo-Pacific is the unstoppable geopolitical concept of the future, and within that it is inevitable that ASEAN centrality will continue. And within ASEAN itself, Indonesia has a large role to play in terms of building bigger linkages with countries of consequence in the Indo-Pacific, including Japan and India, and building more institutionalization across the Indian Ocean and Pacific Oceans as well. And we've had very generous insights from all five of our distinguished speakers, and, and so in reply, I ask you to put your hands together and thank them.